Awesome. All right. Oh, wait a second. Some technical difficulties here. Okay, here we go. All right, so um, last year I spent a month in Costa Rica. Um, I was there for a uh, primate behavior and ecology field course. Um, and so I basically spent my time deep in the rainforest, under the rain, studying monkeys. And so today I would like to tell, talk, tell you about my research there. Um, so the, for this specific project, I studied two species that were uh, living in Costa Rica. So the mental howler monkey that you can see on the left and the wife-based capuchin. So that's just a little preview to uh, the monkeys that I will be talking about you know, in this presentation. Um, so I focused on the prehensile tail. So the prehensile tail is um, basically um, a, a grasping uh, tail. So it has a grasping capability and uh, for primates that do possess that prehensile tail, it can be used in combination with the limbs or alone. So like um, primates can hang from it. Um, the prehensile tail is unique to only five taxonomic groups of New World monkeys. So New World monkeys are found in Central, Central and South America. Um, and so that represents about 15% of all primate species. So it's really a, quite a unique trait. Um, and so in terms of the two species that I studied, so again, the howler that you can see picture, pictured at the top here and the capuchin, um, they actually have anat anatomical differences in their tails. Uh, specifically, the howlers have a rather strong prehensile tail with uh, stronger musculature, and they have a patch of bare skin underneath the tail which provides more traction, whereas the capuchins have a weaker tail. So it is still prehensile, but they don't have the same musculature and they do not have that uh, patch of bare skin. Um, so pre the prehensile tail can affect what is known as positional behavior. Um, positional behavior is simply the way an animal is going to move or the way it's going to position itself when it's being still. Um, and so specifically, the prehensile tail helps with positional behavior in that it provides weight support and balance in an arboreal environment, uh, specifically for primates. Um, it also facilitates activities like traveling, foraging, feeding, and resting. And then uh, finally, it can be impacted by factors such as body size and feeding patterns. Um, regarding the two species that I studied, uh, they're interesting to study together because they do uh, have differences, uh, that they do exhibit differences. Um, the first one being, as I mentioned earlier, the tail anatomy. The howlers have a much stronger um, prehensile tail. The capuchins have a weaker prehensile tail. The two species also differ in morphology. The howlers are much larger. Uh, they weigh about uh, 13 pounds whereas the capuchins are smaller at about eight pounds. And then these two species also differ in their uh, foraging and feeding patterns. Uh, the howlers are folivorous, mean, which means that they mostly eat leaves. And because of that, they are energy minimizers. Leaves don't provide a lot of, of calories. And so the howlers spend a lot of time resting and digesting the leaves. On the other hand, the capuchins are omnivorous. So they have a diverse diet that's made up of fruit, nuts, insects, all sorts of things and they are extractive foragers, which means that when they are looking for food, they are really picking apart the food, unfurling the leaves, opening up the nuts, you know, trying to get the food. So all of this sets up the hypothesis of this study, which was that prehensile tail use and positional behaviors will differ between howlers and capuchins. Um, so I, as I said earlier, I went to Costa Rica for this, uh, for this project. So the site specifically was the La Suerte Biological Field Station in the northeastern region of Costa Rica. Um, the site is located in a very dense tropical rainforest uh, with a very hot and humid weather. Um, so on the left, you can see um, so, sort of a swamp area. So part of the forest was rather uh, yeah, swampy. Uh, there were constant downpours every single day. Um, and then the picture on the right uh, is uh, a trailhead to go to one of the forests where I studied the, the monkeys. 
Um, so you can see that it is really uh, lush uh, and uh, surrounded by just very dense vegetation. Uh, to give you an idea of what the area, uh, you know, houses in terms of uh, biodiversity. So there were not only monkeys, there were also other mammals like sloths. Uh, there were reptiles like iguan iguanas and snakes. Uh, there were birds uh, and also a lot of very big bugs. Um, so yeah, it's just to give you an idea of what uh, animals were there. Um, so for my, for my project specifically, I study, I focused on uh, habituated groups of howlers and capuchins. And so here, what is meant by habituated is that the, the howlers and the capuchins were used to human presence uh, and they were not scared uh, when uh, they would come, uh, when we would encounter them. Um, and I would like to note that for this specific project, I only focused on the adults. Uh, because, as I said earlier, uh, the prehensile tail can help with weight balance. And so had I included younger individuals that were lighter, I would have probably um, seen different behaviors when it comes to prehensile tail use. Because if I'm including individuals that are lighter, they probably don't make as much use of their tail. So that's why I focus solely on adult individuals for both species. Um, so in terms of data collection, I ended up with 14 hours of usable data. Now that does not mean that I only spent 14 hours in the forest. Again, I was there for a month and I was out in the forest every single day from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. So I ended up with a lot more hours, but ultimately that's what I got in terms of hours that are usable to discuss. Um, so to collect my data, I used a method known, known as point sampling. Uh, what this means is that I was focusing on one individual at a time for 20 minutes and every 30 seconds I would record, record the uh, individual's behavior. And so specifically, uh, each time I took a sample, I recorded the subject's sex and age, the locomotor or postural mode of the subject. So locomotor mode would be, is the subject walking, uh, running or climbing? And postural mode would be things like, is the subject sitting or lying down? Um, I also recorded the activity. Uh, so that would be either traveling, foraging, feeding, or resting. And then obviously I recorded tail use. So I was looking at, is the tail wrapped around a branch or is it free? Um, so as a reminder, my, hypo my hypothesis was that uh, prehensile tail use and positional behaviors will differ between howlers and capuchins. And so indeed, my results do show that. Um, specifically here, looking at locomotor modes, so again, when the individuals were in motion, howlers exhibited more tail prehension than capuchins during locomotor modes. And just a uh, quick intro to the graph, so in yellow is the data for the howlers, in red, the data for the capuchins. And then when looking at the postural modes, same thing, the howlers exhibited more tail prehension than the capuchins during the postural modes. And so as a reminder of the postural modes were things like when they're sitting, when they're lying down, so when they're still. So overall, what the data shows here is that the howlers do use their tail, their prehensile tail more than the capuchins, regardless of whether they are moving or being still. Um, so, I do want to focus a little bit more on the specific activities and how tail prehension factored into that. And so this graph shows tail prehension across different activities, traveling, foraging, feeding, and resting. Um, I do want to point out feeding specifically because uh, this is where the prehensile tail was most important for both species. So uh, for both species here, that's where they showed the most uh, use of their uh, prehensile tail. And this actually makes sense because when they're feeding, when monkeys are feeding, they're making use of their hands to put food in their mouths so they no longer hold whatever substrate they're using, so say a branch. And so that's where the prehensile tail is particularly beneficial because it acts as an additional anchor point and provides more security. Now, if we look at resting, this is where there is the greatest disparity in prehensile tail use between the two species. So howlers still displayed a lot of tail prehension during resting, but 
but the Capuchins did not. And so if you think about it here, um, as I mentioned earlier, the Howlers are much larger than the Capuchins. And so uh, they probably needed that additional anchor point when resting because they are at a greater risk of falling from a tree. Whereas the Capuchins are probably just fine uh, draping the, their bodies over a branch without really needing the, their prehensile tail as a, as a security. But overall, what the data shows here is that howlers exhibited more tail prehension than capuchins across all activities. So to go back to the hypothesis, there are indeed differences in the way the, these two species use their tail, their prehensile tail. And what we see is that the larger, heavier howlers use it more regardless, regardless of the activity uh, that they are engaged in. So um, ultimately what the this project shows and what the results demonstrate is that uh, clearly there's evolution in action. These two species are somewhat related in that they are both uh, from uh, Central America, but ultimately they ended up uh, differing in their body size and to uh, compensate for the pressures that come with uh, specifically a larger body size for the howlers the howlers adapted by developing a very strong uh, and very efficient prehensile tail. So again, as I mentioned earlier, they have a much better musculature and they have that patch of bare skin that provides more traction. Uh, whereas the capuchins, they're smaller, so they did not develop any of these features. They still have that grasping tail, but it's just not as strong and not as efficient. Um, so yeah, overall, what this project, project shows and kind of um, illustrates is just evolution in action for features that are shared between species um, and that evolve differently depending on the needs of each individual species. Now, I know that these conclusions are very scientific and very much applied to the field of primatology, so I kind of want to take a step back and uh, actually focus on making this project a something that is more applicable to other students. Um, so this was an incredible opportunity for me. I, before I went, I was planning to major in anthropology. I was very passionate about primates, but I needed that confirmation that I would be able to uh, pursue a career in primatology and that I would be able to go in the field and stand for hours under the rain with my neck getting sore and you know, getting bit by mosquitoes. Um, so that's why I did this field course. I really wanted to know whether I was able to uh, take on such a feat and just be in the field studying primates. Um, so I will say this, it was definitely a challenging thing, a challenging uh, experience, but in the end, I really, it allowed me to push my limits to uh, discover new things about myself. I was terrified of bugs. I thought I would not be able to just stand that at all when I was there, but I, I did just fine. And so what I wanna emphasize here is that I think it's really important for us students, community college students, undergrad students to go out there and look for opportunities to really um, push ourselves and kind of try things out before committing to a specific major or a career or a job. I think it's really important to um, just, yeah, try things, really push yourself uh, and see what you can do. And I also think that encountering challenges is what allows us to grow. And that field course was definitely a challenge, but in the end I did you know, discover things about myself that I didn't think I had. Um, so my point here, uh, kind of just to wrap up is, go out there, look for jobs, look for internships, look for research opportunities that will really allow you to uh, push yourself and challenge yourself. Thank you. I don't know. Is anybody here? Margo. Yeah. Um, hey, Margo, real quick. Why don't you take us uh, out of this uh, share screen yeah, so you can see your audience? Okay, awesome. 
So Margo, obviously an, an amazing job. Um, I don't have a technical question, but more just a comment to, uh, to let everyone know that it was uh, based upon this research that Margot got the top award, uh, the top abstract at the Honors Transfer Council of California Research Conference. And uh, so that's a big deal. That's uh, over 400 submissions and Margot's abstract was considered to be the best one. Um, and that's a, a first time that we've ever had that in, in our in our program. And um, just to, I just wanna say um, what Margo has done in our program in terms of that, what she said at the end of her presentation about trying new things and challenging uh, herself is that uh, to know Margo's story is absolutely nothing short of amazing. And um, when we think about how many presentations she's done, uh, she's one of only two decathlon winners in the history of our honors program. That means that she has presented over 10 times um, uh, at various research conferences. And, and so in the 25 year history, only two students have done this and, um, and Margo is one of them. And no one has won as many awards as, as Margo has, including an exemplary achievement scholarship also at this last conference. And so uh, just from the bottom of my heart, Margo, um, this wasn't the way that I wanted to share all these accomplishments and I thought we would be seeing each other, you know, face to face, but um, you have been a trailblazer in this program and just, uh, I just want to echo what you said, you know, challenging yourself was uh, a beautiful thing to, to see and, and watch and witness. And I know there were tears along the way, um, but there's also been some great moments as well. And, and, and sometimes tears are great moments in their, in their own way. And, and uh, just to see your growth over the last few years has just been nothing short of amazing. So um, just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for all that you've meant to our honors program. Thank you to Lynn for all that wonderful mentorship and, and just uh, all that leadership and, and knowledge that you've shared with our community is uh, so special. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just real quick thing. I actually wanted to mention uh, my parents are here attending today. So I'm really excited about that because it's basically the only opportunity that they've had since I started at MiraCosta to actually attend something. So kind of wanted to echo that and just mention that, but thank you, Chris. thank you. Awesome. <laughs> well, I would say all the same things that Christopher just said, but if I start talking, I'll start to cry. So I'm not gonna do that. And instead, Margo, I'm gonna I go did, in a I different direction. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go in a different direction. I want to hear the worst thing about life in the field. And then ending on a high note, I want to hear the best thing about life in the field. Okay. Well, I thought the bugs would be the worst. I didn't have any issues with that. There were a lot of bugs that was fine. I'm a very picky eater, as some of you may know. And I thought that would be an issue. I absolutely love the food. I thought I would struggle with the heat, and while I did not necessarily enjoy it, it wasn't that much of an issue. Um, I would say that the, the times where I was really frustrated was when I would go out for hours and not find a single monkey, and that happened a lot. So that was definitely challenging and sometimes discouraging, but you know, it was still fun to be out there. The best part about being in the field, uh, I would say that's important for me. I'm a very stressed person. I had never been this relaxed in years. So just, it's not very specific, I guess. It's just being out there in the middle of the forest, surrounded by animals and even bugs. Uh, I was just so relaxed and happy. So yeah, I guess that's kind of my answer. It's not very specific, but that's what I would go with. It's a great answer. I think you've found your future. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I have a technical question and All right. embarrassing. <laughs> um, you blew my mind a couple months ago when you told me that the evolution of Prince Pre and Cell Tail in Capuchins and um, Hellers was completely independent. And then I recently read that actually there's a high density of prehensile tail evolution in South and Central America, like in carnivorans like coatis and kinkajous. Right, yeah. Yeah. Did you see anything in the literature or even like just in your observations in the forest about like what is it about the South American forest that has the evolution of these prehensile tails? That is a really good question. I definitely did not read anything about like anything other than 
primate related literature, so I wouldn't be able to speak for, you know, other critters that do have um, a prehensile tail, especially in South and Central America. I'm not sure. I, I don't know what about the environment would make it more beneficial for them to, because there's still, I don't know if you look at Africa, there's still forested areas with very high canopy, so I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm really, I don't know. I would have to look yeah. into that. It's a mystery, I guess. I think a lot of people don't know, but yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah, great question though, but I'm, af I'm afraid I don't have a very specific answer for that. I'll keep looking for it. Margo, I want to finish with just a really easy question. Um, what made you to decide on the two species you did to study and not something like spider monkeys? Right, okay. Yeah, so that's something that I wanted to mention. Um, so the specific site where I went, there were three different primate species, so the howlers and the capuchins that I worked on, but there was also the spider monkeys. Um, I ended up working on the two, the howlers and the capuchins because the spider monkeys are very um, elusive. Uh, every single encounter that I had with them, they would uh, first throw sticks at me to try to scare me away. Um, and then they would just end up leaving fairly quickly. So they, they for my level as a, a new uh, researcher and primatologist, it's just not doable in the time that I had to uh, study the spiders, the spider monkeys. So that's why I ended up doing just the howlers and the capuchins. Um, I could have done a project just on the howlers or just on the capuchins, but because I wanted to make things more complicated and push myself, I went with the, both species, the howlers and the capuchins. And even those two looked like, in the photos, they looked like they were giving you a suspicious look, so I can't even imagine how um, apprehensive the spider monkeys were. Yes, I, I got pooped on by howlers, and I got sticks thrown at me by the capuchins as well, so I thought that was fun. All right, thank you, Margo. That's our time for Q&A. Next, we're going to have John LaRue again with the evolution of mitochondrial uncoupling proteins in vertebrates, a paradox in birds. Thank you. Let me pull up the share screen here. Okay. So, um, in order to, before I mention what the heck an uncoupling protein is, I want you to think about what it means to be warm blooded. That's a term we use, right? We're warm blooded. Your dog is warm blooded. Your cat is warm blooded, but your pet snake is cold blooded. And Warm blooded and cold blooded are kind of misnomers because a snake's blood very well may be just as warm or warmer than your blood if it's sitting out in the sun. So really what we're talking about is endothermy. You know, an endotherm like a mammal uh, will be keeping its temperature roughly constant uh, in spite of changes in the ambient temperature where an ectotherm like a reptile, a snake, a lizard, its ch uh, internal temperature is going to change uh, in relationship to its environment. And so if you're an endotherm, you're not making your, your body heat from the sun, you're making it from your food energy. So we think, okay, fuzzy mammals like us and mice and dogs and cats are endotherms that are warm-blooded. But you may or may not be familiar, but uh, birds are also endotherms. They generate their own body heat. And you might think that the mechanism for that would be the same. You know, it's the same physiological function. And you would be right in some ways. But on the other hand, you also have to consider that if we're thinking about the common ancestor of birds and mammals, we would think it's probably going to be something that was more like a lizard than it was like a bird or a mammal. So it was probably a, an ectotherm, and therefore the evolution, just like I talked about with those, those tails and Margot's monkeys, the, the evolution of prehensile tails was uh, convergent. In this birds and mammals, the evolution of um, endothermia is convergent. But they both have to do something with something called an uncoupling protein. And so that leads me to my central thesis that uh, the loss and conservation of different uncoupling proteins in vertebrates is paradoxical to the protein's function. So what that illustrates for you is that natural selection is a tinkerer working with existing variation and improving upon it, not a forward planning engineer who has you know, top-down design, starting with a plan and moving forward with it. That's not how natural selection works. So the physiological function concerned here is non-shivering thermogenesis. Mammals and birds also generate heat by you know, fast twitching their muscle fibers. That's shivering thermogenesis. But in non-shivering thermogenesis, we're considering uh, stuff that's going on in the mitochondria. And so this is a stained uh, electron micrograph of a real mitochondrion. 
they're not really blue and magenta, but it helps show you the different parts of the mitochondrion. So something important to consider is the mitochondrial matrix. All those infolded um, segments there are all part of the uh, mitochondrial matrix. And to give you a better look at this, I'll show you a, a, a fake mitochondria in a diagram. So we have the mitochondrial matrix here, this blue thing. And uh, in between this outer membrane and this inner membrane of the mitochondrial matrix, we have the inner membrane space. And so when talking about non-shivering thermogenesis, I want to zoom in on the inner mitochondrial membrane and talk about what's going on there. So this is a little bit confusing to look at first, but I'll break it down for you. Um, this is the inner mitochondrial membrane. It's got these protein complexes embedded in it. And what the mitochondrion is doing here is it's pumping protons, those, those hydrogen ions, outside of the, outside of the inner uh, the matrix. So it's pumping it out of the matrix into the inner membrane space to create a higher concentration of protons out here than in here. And so what that difference in charge creates is a voltage. So really, uh, mitochondria are organic batteries in that way. So it creates this voltage, and what it uses that voltage is that, that difference in charge causes the protons to want to, you know, want to re-enter the matrix. But really, optimally, the only way they have to do that is through this ATP synthase protein. And so it's using the force of that voltage, that energy stored in that voltage, to drive the synthesis of ATP, which is the cell's energy currency. But what's that uh, UCP thing there? You might have guessed, that's an uncoupling protein. So what it's effectively doing there is it's just allowing those protons to re-enter the matrix without really even doing anything. So it's short-circuiting that, that gradient, that voltage, uh, and rather than having them go through the ATP synthase, it just goes through the uncoupling protein, short circuits the voltage, and it uh, dissipates that gradient, that voltage. And so when you're dissipating that voltage without actually doing any work, you're not driving that chemical drive shaft of ATP synthase, um, that dissipates the force as heat. That, that energy stored in the voltage uh, just gets dissipated as heat because it's not being used to do work. Okay, so this is um, a protein ribbon model of an uncoupling protein. And you can see it's embedded in the mitochondrial inner membrane there. And you can, you can kind of see um, in between these ribbons, these protein subunits, if, the, if you can imagine looking at it three-dimensionally, there's this channel uh, that's created by the membrane, or sorry, by the protein. And so that channel, uh, excuse me, uh, allows protons to re-enter the mitochondrial matrix, dissipating that, uh, that voltage as heat. And Uncoupling proteins seem to be pretty, pretty ancient or have a pretty ancient origin. They're present in invertebrates, plants, uh, invertebra invertebrates as well. And in vertebrates, we have three different versions or homologs of uh, uncoupling proteins. Uncoupling protein one, two, and three. Uh, pretty simple. So diff the different functions of those, those homologs, the, these different uncoupling protein versions, they have different physiological functions. The first, uh, UCP1, is understanding from what we know about mammals, that's our, our primary thermogenic protein, that's the stuff that's being used uh, in non-shivering thermogenesis to generate heat, while uh, UCP2 and UCP3 are being used for energy regulation and to reduce the production of reactive oxygen species. And given what we know about breathing, it, you might not think that oxygen would be um, dangerous to biological systems, but bio or, uh, oxygen's a highly reactive molecule, and so it, you know, can, it reacts with cells and tissues and can kind of tear them up. And so we call that oxidative stress or oxidative stress. Okay, so um, those three UCP homologs, they're present in the most recent common ancestor of the crown vertebrates. So the common ancestor of ray and lobe fin fishes, we have a confirmed presence of uncoupling protein one, uncoupling protein two, and uncoupling protein three. We know that because modern ray and lobe fin fishes have those three homologs. Um, interestingly, we have a loss of uh, uncoupling protein 1 in the reptile lineage, so it was preserved in mammals, but for some reason reptiles, including birds, lost UCP1 after their split from mammals, and then uh, UCP2 was then again lost in birds, uh, specifically in birds, after their split with crocodilians, so we found uncoupling protein 2 and uncoupling protein 3 in crocodilians, but only uncoupling protein three in birds. So it's kind of curious, right? We have these high energy thermogenic animals 
but they have no thermogenic protein, huh? They don't have that uncoupling protein one. Remember, that was the one that was in, implicated in non shivering thermogenesis. Well, why, how are they generating body heat? Well, um, it's important to consider that when we're talking about, you know, UCP1, we know that as the, um, the thermogenic protein, that's based on our data that we have from mammals. And so we think about, okay, uncoupling protein one was lost in reptiles after the mammal reptile split. We're still talking about ectotherm ectothermic organisms here. Um, so it was lost in the pre-endothermic ancestor of birds. So when it wasn't really advantageous for the ancestor of birds to have of this potential thermogenic protein because they weren't making their own body heat, uh, it was lost. And uh, birds later evolved thermogenesis and they, you know, evolution is a tinkerer. They had to work with what it had. It didn't have that variation present with uncoupling protein one. So they end up using uncoupling protein three for thermogenesis. And we can see how this inf uh, illustrates this tinkerer narrative. There's in random chance perhaps that uh, certain proteins are lost in organisms that can't take full advantage of them. And then uh, once you know it's advantageous for the, the, the lineage leading to birds to evolve uh, endothermy, had to use another means besides what the mammals used because for whatever reason, they didn't, mammal, the lineage leading to mammals did not uh, lose uncoupling protein one. And this reminds me of a kind of a, a funny story from a biologist, Sidney Brenner, a pretty important biologist, but he, he had this, he lampooned this idea of thinking of evolution as a, a forward thinking planner by imagining this scenario where there was some organism in the Cambrian that was holding on to some protein because it might be useful in the Cretaceous. Again, that's not how natural selection works. It's a, it's a non-sentient process. It's not forward planning. It only uh, preserves the variations that work and deletes those that doesn't. Okay, so looking at this in mammals, we have the same, in mammals and birds, we have the same goal of endothermy, but we're approaching with different strategies based on perhaps random chance or what variations are present. So mammals are using UCP1, birds are using UCP3 for non-shivering thermogenesis, and in mammals, non-shivering thermogenesis is mostly happening in the brown adipose chip tissue, so your brown fat cells, whereas in birds, it's all happening in skeletal muscle. And this also reinforces this idea that uh, natural selection is working as a tinkerer. It just works with what it has, and it's not projecting a, a future plan. It's not using a top-down design. Presumably, brown adipose tissue could be useful to birds if they had it, but that variation for brown adipose tissue wasn't there, and so skeletal muscle is being used for non-shivering thermogenesis in birds. Okay, and so when talking about uncoupling protein two and the interesting paradox there, I think it'd be interesting to share with you some information about avian respiratory anatomy. So um, unlike a mammal like us where we breathe in and out, as you can see in this diagram here, uh, birds use these really cool air sacs, so they pump unidirectionally. They have this unidirectional flow of air using those air sacs. And what that involves, if you look on the right, uh, to the right of that main diagram, you can see that their tissues are continually exposed to that reactive oxygen. So even when they're exhaling, their tissues are being exposed to oxygen. And so that's great because you get all this high oxygen. It's this great high oxygen ph physiology for powered flight. But then you have those additional costs of oxidative stress, more oxidative stress than a mammal would have because your tissues are constantly exposed to oxygen. And this gets really interesting when, when we look at where UCP2 is lost. This protein that purportedly um, helps regulate oxidative stress is being lost after the split with crocodilians and birds. And um, if you look at the animals that evolved after the split of crocodilians and birds, we have things like pterosaurs, which given the uh, similarity of crocodilian and bird lungs, they probably had that same uh, air sac system, that countercurrent exchange um, for unidirectional flow. And you have these, you know, these non-avian theropod dinosaurs who weren't using powered flight, but um, they were still these, these high oxygen souped up super predators. They were, they were operating with uh, very high metabolism. So it makes it interesting that why would these organisms that are arguably higher energy and have more oxygen in their physiology than a crocodile, why is it that they're the ones who lost that, uh, that protein associated with redu reducing oxidative stress? It's a curious paradox. And uh, what also 
illustrates this is when we look at the fossil skeletons of uh, extinct non-avian theropod dinosaurs, they have those, uh, they have evidence of connective tissues on the bones to where you would have the air sacs. So we have pretty good evidence that we think these, uh, these non-avian theropods had these air sacs and this countercurrent system like modern birds. So they're these high oxygen, um, thermogenic, you know, like Ferrari-like super predators. Why would they be losing this protein that's uh, associated in reducing that stress from oxygen? So we have this paradox. It's, we have this protein that's used to reduce stress from oxygen, but these lineage of, of dinosaurs and birds specifically, they don't have this protein to reduce stress from oxygen. That led me to ask the question, when would the dinosaurs and you know, the, the birds uh, lose this protein, this uncoupling protein too? And to answer that question, I constructed a um, phylogeny of vertebrate uncoupling proteins. And I'll walk you through some of the color coding on this. I color coded all the uncoupling protein one uh, samples in red, all of the uncoupling protein two samples in blue, and all the uncoupling protein three samples in green. And then all of the proteins that belong to birds, I just put in purple. And so you can see, as we might expect, all of, from what I've been telling you so far, uh, most of the bird proteins all um, seem to be closely related to um, the uncoupling protein three and reptiles. So we understand, okay, birds are, excuse me, um, birds are reptiles. They only have uncoupling protein three. This makes sense that the protein that we're seeing in them is grouping with a reptile uncoupling protein three. But then there was this weird stuff over here where I got this group of bird proteins that was um, aligning closely with uncoupling protein two. And then this other group of bird proteins that was aligning uh, closely with uncoupling protein one. And that was a complete shock to me because I was being told in most literature I was reading that um, birds only have one uh, uncoupling protein homolog. And uh, that was what I was expecting looking for it. But something that I noticed when looking at it is that these, these birds that we examine here, it's things like emus and kiwis and um, ostrich, uh, um, all excluding this hummingbird here, they all belong to a, a group of birds called the paleognathi. And the paleognathi neognathi split is the most ancient taxonomic split in modern birds. So that led me to think maybe it's just the, this, these neoaves, the neognathi, that are the ones who only have one uncoupling protein. So really that loss of that second uncoupling protein may not have happened way back near the common ancestor with birds and crocodiles. It could be actually pretty recent in bird history for, for whatever reason. But then that also leaves open the question as to why both of these protein uh, uh, groups and these paleognaths, why they grouped with both uncoupling protein two and one, but none of them near three. It seems to be there's, there's some mystery there. And in order to kind of get a clear idea of what I was looking at, I, uh, I tested the same phylogeny with different algorithms and got more or less the same result. There's some variation in the exact specificity of the trees, but you still have those same main groups of, you know, lots of the bird proteins grouping near reptile UCP3, and then these other groups over here with UCP1 and UCP2. So there could be a variety of reasons for that. Uh, one to, to keep in mind is that those, um, those sequences used for those paleognaths were randomly generated by the National Cent uh, Center of Biotechnology's um, database to um, just based on the, the genomes of those organisms that wasn't actually, this data wasn't actually being collected for research on, on coupling proteins, but I still do think it's something worth investigating. Uh, and it might explain how birds are dealing with oxidative stress, even without this extra protein that uh, purportedly reduces oxidative stress. So some conclusions and significance with this whole hullabaloo. Um, most of the data that we have on coupling proteins comes from mammals and our perspective on it is kind of mammal centric. As I mentioned, we, we don't, when we say uncoupling protein one, we really are talking about how it operates in mammals. Same with uncoupling protein two and same with uncoupling protein three. And so we have a lot to learn about birds. For example, we know that birds are missing one of these proteins that uh, reduces oxidative stress, but we also know that they incur less oxidative stress than mammals, despite their high oxygen physiology. And we're not really sure how they do it. They live really long. Um, 
there's been some papers about how birds uh, sacrifice oxidative stress um, during reproduction. So what I'm really showing you with this is that there, there might be a single physiological function like reducing oxidative stress or uh, non-shivering thermogenesis, but there's so many different metabolic pathways that contribute to each of those functions. And so what that gives you is multiple, multiple routes that an organism can uh, evolve along and produce changes from any modality. And uh, what kind of, as I'm saying again, evolution is not goal-directed. It just works so that it has small incremental steps favoring certain variations over others. And it's this process that has given rise to uh, what the great man Darwin said, endless forms, most beautiful. And uh, thank you all very much. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you, John. Those are a lot of um, really good graphics you managed to find to go along with your presentation. We're running a little bit over time, especially you, yeah. since we have, we have two presenters left, but we want to make sure we have time for one or two questions if anyone has them for John. All right, I have a question for you, John. Yeah. Um, you may have answered this in your presentation. I just want to see if I'm understanding correctly. Did you say that there was an advantage to losing the uncoupling proteins? Was it, did you say that it was based on like the temperature at the time that the species kind of diverged? I didn't say. Um, I would think what it probably would look like is just relaxed selection on it for some reason, that there would have been less of a reason to hang on to it. You know, it's another, if it's not being used very much, you might as well let it go. So I guess that's the, the closest answer I can get to it is that, you know, it just wasn't being used for whatever reason. And so it was let go. Do you think it could have anything to do with just the geological timing of when they kind of split from a common ancestor? It just happened to be warmer at the time? It's a good question. Are you talking about the loss of uncoupling protein one? Right. Yeah. Um, that would have been during the Permian period, I think. Um, be pretty dry and hot. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if there's much to say about that, but it's, it's interesting to think about for sure. Just another paradox right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, John. Next, we're going to have Sherry Mande. I apologize if I'm saying your name incorrectly. And her presentation is Manu Samoa, Your Vision Be Clear, Expressing Samoan Storytelling Through Metal Music. Hold on a second, let me, um, I'm trying to figure out how to, uh, oh no, where did I put it? Okay, here, I'm trying to set this up here for a minute. Um, I'm really nervous, y'all, this is my first time. <laughs> oh, it'll be great. So I'm not sure if, okay, so I'm gonna share, hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. Um, and hopefully I will still be able to read my script while doing this. <laughs> like, I don't know. Anyways, um, maybe not. Uh, can you guys still see the PowerPoint? Yeah, it looks good. But you don't see my script, right? Um, not as no, far as I can tell. The, okay. It'll stay. It'll stay on whatever screen that you chose to show. Okay. Thank. Thanks. Okay. This yes. Is totally new to me. I'm like, um, I don't know if this is gonna work, but hopefully, okay. Um. Okay. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. A little, a lot nervous. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation, Manu Samoa. Your vision. Your vision be clear. Expressing Samoan storytelling through metal music. I'd like to start off by saying that I will be saying a lot of Samoan words and I would like to apologize now in case I've mispronounced them. Um, I use these words not to get credit for the research that I've done, but I, to acknowledge the specificity that this is a Samoan legend and um, culture to differentiate the fact that, um, and refrain from making a blanket Polynesian reference, which happens so often. Um, with that said, about a bit about me, my name is Sherry Mandy, and I am a third generation Filipino born and raised in Hawaii. I grew up thinking that I was a mixture of Filipino, Hawaiian, and Chinese. I've since taken a DNA test, and I have learned that I'm 100% Filipino, and although I don't specifically have Hawaiian blood, 
I do have Pacific Islander DNA markers. I moved here to California in 1991 and have been living here in the mainland ever since. I'm also a metalhead, hence why we're watching this. And I have been, in a, um, I have been a concert photographer here in San Diego metal scene for about six years. Um, growing up as a teen in the 80s as a metalhead in Hawaii um, is not as rare as you think, and it would be, um, you, you would think that it would be. And even though it's been 30 years um, where metals, you know, became popular in the 80s, um, even though it's been 30 years, um, we still haven't seen a metal band come out of Hawaii or the Pacific Islands for that matter. Um, um, especially one that's representing Pacific Islanders. And so the reason why I picked Shepherd's Reign is because they are, um, they dub themselves a Polynesian metal band. Um, despite, and one of the things that I would like to also point out is that this, it, the Pacific, um, that it is important because um, um, music and dance is very important in the music Polynesian culture. And so for them to be the first in 30 years of metal history to be a Polynesian um, metal band is, um, is pretty um, unique in itself. Um, I will be sharing a video with you from a band called Shepherd's Rain, and they are a band from Oitawaroa, um, Oitawaroa, New Zealand. <laughs> Their song Limanu is inspired by the legend of an ancient Samoan warrior named Mana Samoa, who was a warrior for uh, Melitoa, who was a king of Samoa at one time. Traditionally, this legend is also told to ch um, Samoan children as a fa'a, fa'ogo, which is a story that is told with hand motions that will, that also help tell the story. So if you all saw um, um, Moana, um, the grandmother talks with her hands while she, you know, while she's talking, she's using her hands. And that is very um, um, specific to Fa'algo. Fa um, I was very fortunate to be able to have a brief interview with um, Feliva, Feliva James, the singer and the lyricist for this song. He graciously interpreted this song for me and explained to me the meaning and importance of this song to the band explained that the song and video is based on a famous legend of the warrior Mana Samoa. The legend which is depicted in this video goes something like this. So this is what you'll be seeing during the video. This is what, what the storyline is about. The chief Maile Toa had had so many enemies that he called around to his mighty clans and to his friends for a formidable warrior, warrior who can go out and vanquish his enemies. Manu Samoa hears this call and tells the, his chief, if this is done according to your will, just point your hand to your enemy, at which Malatoya points to the east, the west, and the north, telling Manu Samoa where his enemies live. Manu Samoa li leaves to do Manatoa's bidding and comes back to some time later, letting Mal Maliatoa know that his enemies have killed or have been killed. Then he produces some parts of the slain enemies to prove to Ma Malatoa, who then reigns as king of Samoa for many years. This is a story that is told to children in Samoa as, um, you know, kind of historical legend. Um, um, in my interview, Fili Va explains, we use the Siva Tao um, because we thought of our ourselves as the warriors in our period of time, fighting for the king, which is Polynesia slash the Pacific. Lemanu is our chant as we go forth into battle with the world as, Poly as a Polynesian, um, Polynesian metal band. As we go into our journey, we carry all our family with the help of our ancestors. This is the true meaning behind the song. And although the, the um, sorry, and although the members vary ethnic, ethnic, ethnically, in, in, in ethnicity, they all identify as Polynesian. Metal music is predominantly European and especially in the subgenre of folk metal. And in this next picture, hopefully I'll get it. Um, the, wait, where am I? Metal music is predominantly European and especially in the subgenre of folk metal which is what Shepherd's Reign would fall under. Folk metal is a mixture of heavy metal music and folk music featuring indigenous instruments like bagpipes in this particular band. Metasol is from Estonia 
and um, as you can see the the singer has um, or he's also the singer but he's playing bagpipes and spinning around um, and wearing Estonian clothes <laughs> folk clothes I guess um, in in uh, sorry Sorry, in Shepherd's Rain, Shepherd's Rain's video, they play a pate drum, which um, in the video you'll see them playing it. It'll be front and center, about halfway into the into, into the video. Um, the pate drum um, is um, a drum that's played in um, Samoan music. It's a, tra a traditional drum. Um, the lyrics in particular to this genre is usually based on fantasy, legends, history, and have sometimes pagan themes. So, you know, as I said before, um, I'm not going to consider myself a, you know, like a, uh, what do you call that, an, an expert in metal music, but because of these different things, they are considered a folk music band. Um, it's the only reason why I'm bringing that up. Um, I believe this is the first metal song that's sung entirely in Samoan and as you will see in all the video images in this video um oh gosh sorry I'm switching back and forth between these things and muting myself I think um, um okay I'm sorry sung entirely in Samoan, as you will see in this video, and all the images in this video speak of Samoan culture, from the lyrics to the visuals of the pate drum, which I just showed, and then the, um, the Samoan war clubs, which you'll see in the video as well, um, being held by the singer and the actor that is portraying Mano Samoa, and also um, PALA tattoos, and you'll see that as well in the video. All these things symbolize strength and respect within Samoan culture. All of them convey a message calling forth warriors to go into battle, and in this case, calling Polynesians to go forth and be known in the metal community. A Siva Tau itself is not just a warrior chant, like a Haka's, uh, you know, like the, whole, the warrior chant from the Maori. Um, it's, it's a little bit different. They don't stick their tongues out. They, they chant, and, and it's also one to call and to rally and to inspire their people. So like calling them forth and um, also giving a warning to their enemies to like say, hey, we're coming. Um, for my title, I chose the lyrics Manasamao, uh, mana, oh, hold on. Getting a little bit better at this. Um, for my title, I chose the lyrics Mana Samoa, your vision be clear because they are telling themselves and the other Poly Polynesians to have a clear vision um, which is to go into the world and be, be victorious. The chorus translated states, fight for your homeland, don't rest until victorious, stand proud, uh, Samoa stand proud and defiantly, fight with your all, do what must be done to win. For a marginalized community within a community, this is important and significant in that it calls for Polynesians to be prepared and to be heard without compromising their culture or heritage to be palatable to a predominantly European genre. As I conclude this presentation, please enjoy this video and let it speak for itself. I think this will work. I hope this is gonna work. Can you guys hear it? No, I think we might have to try resharing and checking the share sound button. I understand what you're saying. Um, when you press share screen, on the lower left, oh, there should be a button perfect. for... Perfect. Got it. Yeah, found it. Good. Sorry. <laughs> Let me start it over. There it is. Samoa! Saungi akabu rukawa! Yakau ni makwaka! Yafai ni mafai! Limanu! Saungiya!
Okay. Okay. Anyways, um, let me go back. Uh, oops. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys caught in the video um, the 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 tattoos that they had um, that the the main actor had. Um, from his waist down to his thighs, but that's called a pae. I cannot pronounce it. Paea, paea, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, and that is a traditional um, tattoo. Um, with Samoan culture, you don't just go and get a, a Samoan tattoo for no reason. It means something. There's um, a story and history and a rite of passage. Um, you don't want to have, um, they're usually done by somebody that specifically does that particular type of tattoo. Um, it's not something that just, um, um, that you just go down to the tattoo artist and say, hey, I like this picture. Can you do this on top of me? It is a lot of significance. And it's, a, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a right um, to have that particular tattoo. And um, there was something else and I can't remember what it was, but um, oh, at the very end, I don't know if you saw that they had a dedication to the children of Samoa that had died in 2019. I think there was like 65 children that died of um, small, was it smallpox or measles? I think it was measles. Um, but um, that concludes my presentation if anybody has questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. That was great. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. Cool. Uh, yeah, Sherry, you said you uh, you interviewed the artists. Do they? Um, I was wondering how did they see themselves where they fit within kind of a, a global phenomenon of folk metal? Like, do they really see themselves as folk metal artists, or is it kind of just kind of just happened to fall into it? They they consider themselves a Polynesian metal band. Um, I don't think that they would consider themselves a folk band. They can say they, um, a lot of um, within the genre itself, um, when they want to set themselves apart and not be labeled, they just call themselves a metal band. Um, and I think if you were to take away the Polynesian portion, they would just say that they were a metal band instead of falling under that whole scope of folk metal. At the same time, within the folk metal um, genre, um, you have bagpipes. Um, they'll play um, drums as well, where you know they're like skinned drums that are that have lots and lots of decorations on it um, with um, Celtic ruins and things like that on there. Um, and so they'll talk about like um, some of the story. Some of the songs will be about pagan pagan gods and things like that. There's a band called Arcona, and I believe. All the lyrics are sang in a dialect of Russian, um, where um, even if you spoke Russian, it's hard to, to um, interpret the words. <laughs> um, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, I think so, because just listening to it, it was I could see how maybe they wouldn't really see themselves as folk metal artists, because they, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of folk instruments so that was just no aside from the pate which would like i said would is the one that would make it a more follow under the the folk metal genre um and they use that within almost all of her, i think all of their songs um feature the pate or the pati is how it's pronounced sorry very cool is there somebody else i had we have time for about one more question Sherry, I was wondering, um, do they do a lot of work like that? Or was that kind of a one-off thing for them? Um, their songs, so they have other songs where it talks about more of like their history or their family lineage, like their own personal stories. Um, but as far as it being a song that sang in Samoan, it being a Sivatel, that one is um, specific. Th that one's the only song that they have like that. Um, but it's also off of their newest album as well. So, um, you know, 
<laughs> and was the name of the group in your description if people wanted to find more? Yes, it's um, Shepherd's, um, Shepherd's Rain. And that's the name of the band? Yes, and the, the song is called Rumanu. Okay. So I can... Oh yeah, if you want to put it in the chat so we can find it. Yes. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. We're going to move on to our last presentation for Virtual Omni. Kylie, if you're ready, we have um, Kylie Nekachi's presentation, Bittersweet Memories, the Impact of Processed Sugar Consumption on Short-Term Memory. Okay, can you guys see it? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. You have a test in an hour and you need something to keep you focused. Do you choose almonds or a Snickers bar? Your taste buds went out and you choose the Snickers bar. But what impact does this decision have on your brain? And, sorry, my computer. Okay, there. Um, and will the sugar from the Snickers bar impact your test score? I've been curious about sugar's impact on the brain for several years now, um, having studied the impacts a bit on memory in long-term diseases such as dementia and Alzheimer's. But for the last few years, I've nannied and babysat for a number of families, and I've noticed distinct differences in attention span, focus, and academic performance among kids who eat loads of sugar um, compared to the kids who have it in moderation. So I've become curious to see what impact sugar has on the brain in the short term, uh, specifically the impact it may have on short-term memory. Americans consume about 150 pounds of added sugar every year. To put that in perspective, um, in 1900, we were consuming about 60 pounds of added sugar every year. And in 1800, we were consuming 18 pounds per year. Now, this increase could be for a number of reasons, but one of them is likely that we are now surrounded by sugar, and it can be found in over 600,000 food items in the middle aisles of the grocery store. Added or processed sugar refers to uh, sugar that's not naturally occurring. So there's the naturally occurring sugar in a grape, and then there's high fructose corn syrup in grape jelly. Often on a nutrition label, these sugars end in O's, so sucrose, maltose, dextrose, uh, high fructose corn syrup, uh, and then the healthier sounding ones, evaporated cane juice or brown malt syrup. But what's so bitter about sugar anyway? Well, today I'll be exploring the impact sugar has on the brain, how sugar impacts memory via the gut microbiome, and the implications this may have on our sugar laden society. Now, I want to be clear that the brain needs sugar to function. Um, it needs glucose, but it doesn't need high fructose corn syrup or a plethora of the other processed sugars we've become familiar with. But why is this the case? How does eating processed sugar impact your brain? To explore this, I'll first need to explore what happens when we eat sugar. And it all starts in the gut. Now, when I refer to gut, I'm referring to the large intestine or the colon. Um, and the diverse ecosystem in which trillions of microscopic organisms, such as bacteria, live is known as the gut microbiome. And there are two dominant bacterial phyla, mainly Bacteroidetes bacteria and Firmicutes bacteria um, in a healthy gut. Sorry, in a healthy gut. The ratio of Bacteroidetes is higher relative to lower Firmicutes levels. Uh, but scientists have recently discovered that the ratio of bacteria in one's gut uh, can impact not only the functioning in the body, but also the function of the brain. So how does the gut impact the brain? Well, this occurs through the uh, microbiota gut-brain axis. Uh, the gut communicates with the brain via a bidirectional communication system known as the gut-brain axis. Um, via this axis, a dysbiotic gut microbiome can, uh, which is marked by higher Firmicutes levels relative to lower Bacteroidetes levels, uh, it can communicate its dysbiosis to the brain. And a dysbiotic gut can cause inflammation to the brain and has been shown to inflame an area of the brain known as the hippocampus. 
Now, the hippocampus is the brain region responsible for short-term memory. So damage or inflammation to this part of the brain can have an impact on our short-term memory. So scientists um, in Australia wanted to test the connection or observe the connection uh, between sugar and how it impacts the gut and then how a dysbiotic gut might impact our memory. So they took two groups of rats and the first group was a control group and the second group they found liquid sucrose or sugar and they tested their spatial memory via a Barnes maze test. Um, and they tested them over the course of two weeks and they found at the end of that two weeks that the sugar-fed rats had reduced bacteroidetes bacteria or that good bacteria in their gut and increased levels of bromidetes bacteria. Uh, so they essentially had dysbiotic gut microbiome. And they also found that because of this, because of the dysbiotic gut, the sugar group uh, had slower expiration times in the maze and also limited expiration compared to the control group. Uh, and they concluded that the sugar fed group had impaired hippocampal function. You say, great, but those are rat studies. What about humans? Um, rats are often used in gut microbiome studies because it's really simple to populate or depopulate a rat's uh, gut with bacteria as needed um, and to observe the germ-free rat in a controlled environment without all the variables that can impact humans. So the following two studies observe the link between sugar and the brain. Uh, however, the researchers conducting these studies didn't test the middle link of an impacted microbiome. But I thought it was important to see the impact that sugar does impact human brains, not just mice and rat brains. So researchers uh, at another Australian, Australian university um, tested 102 healthy young male and female adults uh, and they separated them into two groups. One was the experimental group uh, and one was the control group. So group one was fed breakfast with no added sugar and group two was exposed to breakfast high in sugar. Um, they tested them over the course of four days and tested them between the hours of 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. with uh, verbal memory tests. And they found that the sugar group showed poor verbal memory scores at day four than they did at day one. And the control group maintained the same memory outcomes um, days one through four. So the researchers concluded that the higher dietary sugar levels can cause significantly poor memory outcomes in the short term. Another study uh, at the Yale School of Public Health wanted to look at uh, the impact that sugar had on the brain as well. So they looked at 97 male and female undergraduate students and they fed them eight chocolate chip cookies and four chocolate biscuits and tested their memory 15 minutes after after consuming sugar via a verbal memory test. And then they tested the same participants after they had not consumed sugar. So the researchers found that while on sugar, the, um, the sugar-fed group performed 24% poorer um, than when they were not fed sugar. Um, and the high sugar dietary intake causes poor hippocampal performance in um, the group. And Researchers concluded that the high sugar diet caused deficits in hippocampal dependent learning and memory functions. So why should Americans care about the relationship between sugar and memory? Sugar is an equity issue. So recently researchers have found a connection between socioeconomic status and sugar consumption and researchers at, in Chicago wanted to test the uh, coral wanted to see if socioeconomic status was correlated with sugar consumption. So they um, surveyed over 1,300 male and female fifth and sixth grade students across 14 different Chicago public schools and administered 24-hour beverage recall surveys for the kids to fill out, uh, which included categories of uh, sugar sweetened beverages, including sodas, flavored juices, and sports drinks. And they measured socioeconomic status uh, by whether the child was eligible for free or reduced lunches because if they were eligible for those free or reduced lunches, um, they were also um, on food stamps. 
So the researchers discovered that the highest sugar sweetened beverage consumption was correlated with the highest free or reduced lunch eligibility. And sugar consumption was 76% higher in low socioeconomic status students versus their high socioeconomic status counterparts. Um, therefore, the researchers concluded that low socioeconomic status populations are more vulnerable to sugar sweetened beverage consumption. So we know the impact that sugar can have on the brain. Um, and for decades, researchers have observed stark uh, differences um, in academic performance among low socioeconomic status students uh, versus their high socioeconomic status counterparts. These differences in academic performance can be, uh, are, are maybe caused by a number of factors, uh, including limited resources in schools and low socioeconomic um, zip codes. Um, however, knowing what we know about sugar and how it impacts memory in the brain, it's clear that sugar consumption may play a significant role um, in the impaired academic performance among low-income students. Sugar consumption impacts the brain by impacting the gut microbiome, and memory impairment can impair academic performance. This is cyclical and a hard cycle to break. If you're born into a house surrounded by sugar, unaware of its ill effects, maybe you are consistently choosing sugar before and after school because you're surrounded by it. Um, I wonder the impact this may be having on test scores, on academic performance, um, and even the futures of kids born into low socioeconomic households. These are questions that obviously need more exploring, um, but the next time you're faced with a daunting math exam, you might want to choose something that will actually help you remember what you studied. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Kylie. Um, I have a question, a couple of questions, but I'll stick with one. Um, so have they, when they feed the rats sugar, what kind of sugar are they giving them specifically? Like, are they giving them pure glucose or? So in the one study, um, it was sucrose that they gave them. I think that was the microbiome study. They gave them sucrose. Um, that seemed to be consistent across several studies that I saw. Uh, one, they did give them high fructose corn syrup in one of them. Um, but a lot of them are feeding them sucrose, liquid sucrose. Okay, because I, I was just wondering, like, could they be controlling for other ingredients in the sugar, like if they're pesticides or something that could affect the gut microbiome, are they controlling for that? That's true, and I haven't seen that, Jonathan. That's a great question, though. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of factors that can play into that, but that's a great question. I'll have to look more into that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I was curious, Kyla, you said that the way you got interested in this had to do with kids that you knew. And I was wondering whether, I mean, most of the things, when people talk about kids and sugar, they talk about hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. What made you make this connection with memory rather than hyperactivity? That's a great question. I did go down the avenue just personally on uh, researching that connection between hyperactivity. Um, but I have been interested in memory for a while with Alzheimer's patients. And I think I just, I, I guess I thought there was a tendency to think like, oh, that's far in the future, you know, if it's gonna affect me. So I wanted to see, well, if, is there a connection now um, with, and that could be more relevant to students my age. Um, I was conducting an, and my own data with this um, with students at Miracosta, but it'll happen <laughs> sometime. <laughs> they did an excellent job. Thank you. I have a question. Um, yeah. I didn't see if you completely touched on this topic, but um, what about natural sugar? That's a great question. Um, um, what about natural sugar? Well, when I started looking into it, um, I found that there is a difference in how it does impact the gut microbiome. Um, I have to be honest, I haven't explored that impact as much as I should. Um, 
But in studies that just look at humans and how they are um, impacted by just natural sugar memory wise, they find that there is not the same impact, um, the same negative impact that you see with the sugar. Um, but that's a great question. I get that question a lot. So I need to research it a bit more, especially with how it impacts the gut microbiome. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on Parisa's question just because she was asking about natural sugar. Um, yeah. So something like an orange is high in glucose, right? Which is fuel for the brain, but it also has fiber, which would the fiber in an orange boost your bacteroidetes population? And maybe that would be a good option for yeah, a test? John, yes, my, my brain's not working right now. Um, yes, the fiber does have an impact on it. Um, and also the nutrients that are involved, right? When you're eating a cookie, it's kind of devoid of nutrients. Um, and then you're also just getting that huge spike in sugar. So that certainly has a negative impact on the Firmicutes levels and other bacteria in your gut. Um, but I really have focused on natural sugar and it impacted the brain. And I think I need to really more research more the impact that it will be having on the gut. Jonathan, do we have time for more questions? Um, I think that depends on how long people want to stay, because that's our last presentation. So, Well, let me toss out one more. Um, okay. Kylie, I know you've done a lot of research on gut bacteria, not the topic that most people would spend their life reading about. Um, and I know you've identified some other important variables that can impact that bacterial balance and have important implications like not only memory, but also obesity and other kinds of things. What would you say are the top three factors? You've just identified sugar as a major one that's going to shift or impact that gut microbiome. What are some of the other important factors that are gonna affect our guts? That's a great question. Um, sleep and uh, stress were the other two that I found. There could be whole other research projects on those because sleep and stress and I found sugar as well really did impact the gut microbiome. So um, when you think about things, I appreciate what you said a moment ago that studying things that have to do with Alzheimer's may not really appeal to your classmates. They're thinking, oh, that's way down the line. Why should I be worrying about that? Right. But the extent to which their sleep patterns, which we know are disrupted throughout college life and your stress patterns, which are sky mm -hmm. high throughout college life, and that the, this can have implications okay. that ultimately affect your capacity to learn, your capacity to have a proper metabolic rate, which impacts obesity. These mm -hmm. are important messages, and I so appreciate your consistent uh, hard work in sharing them with your classmates. Thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs> I had a, another question, and let me know if this is too specific, but I was wondering, what is it about the metabolites of these Firmicutes bacteria that promote obesity and cause us to lose our memory. What are these darn little things doing that's such a problem? That's a great question. That's a wonderful question, John. We don't oh, go know. ahead, Lynn, were you gonna say something? No, just uh, kudos, John, that is a great question. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, this could be a 40 minute presentation, <laughs> however. Uh, it, okay, a lot of it has to do with short chain fatty acids. And I really wish I had like time in my presentation to go over it because it was so cool to read about. Um, but a lot of it has to do with short-chain fatty acids and then how it imp impacts um, butyrate um, and that production. So it seems to like there's an over... First off, I just want to say there are several factors, but um, this is one of them that seems to be studied the most in what I found. Um, but there seems to be like an overproduction of butyrate. Um, and then that impacts how inflammation and in, you know the whole insulin resistance thing too, that's a separate factor, um, but it impacts inflammation primarily in the brain. That's an awful answer, John. No, I'll get a better answer that, for you. That's, that was pretty specific, okay. I'm sure, yeah, as you, as you said, I'm sure you could talk about it for another 40 minutes, but just that little glimpse into what's going on was hopeful. Uh, Kylie, I've got a couple questions for you. Hey, Jason. Hi. Go for it. 
So um, I, I guess the first one's pretty quick. Um, for the Yale study where they're looking at, like they, they fed undergraduates uh, a bunch of cookies and then they had another yes. group where they fed them non-sugary foods. Do you mm -hmm. happen to know if it was like the same cookies just without sugar added? I'm just trying to get a handle on like how they do controls for these types of studies. And then uh, yeah. mm -hmm. if it was the same stuff, but without sugar added, do they make up the caloric content somehow? And what do they see as like a, a proper replacement for the sugar calories? A lot of times, they. those are great questions, Jason, thank you. Um, a lot of times in, I think that study specifically, uh, I need to double check, but I believe they use like rice cakes basically for the non-sugar. So they also for, um, I think it was the other study before it too, but they do make up the caloric content, um, but that there are so many variables, you're right. It's really hard with humans, especially to study that control. Um, I'm gonna double check Jason as to what they use because I don't fully remember what they used for the control. Sorry. Well, that's fine. And I know that it's it's like very specific questions about like what one article out of many I'm sure you looked at. But um, I guess the uh, one of the more important questions I really wanted to ask is do you, do you see yourself continuing along this line of research? Because I know that you've been looking at diet and memory for quite a while. Um, do you think that you're going to continue looking at this as you you're going to transfer to UCSD, I think. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Rob Knight. He's one of the professors there, and he works a lot on microbiome. I don't know if you're like planning to try to get into uh, continuing this type of project at UCSD. Jason, I just, I think last week told Lynn about Rob Knight, and I talked to Marco. I think about him too. Um, yes. And I just found out that he was at UCSD last week, and I've been following his research on the microbiome for over a year, so that was really cool um, to, to realize that he was there. Yes, to answer, um, I don't know why I've always been interested in it the last few years. I'm sure people are sick of it, so thank you for still listening, but um, I also could just do research on the gut microbiome and read about it forever. I don't know why, but that link to me is really interesting that, you know, we have some control over maybe um, over outcomes. And it's, it's really interesting to me to see too, like in America and also having babysat and nannied for a lot of families um, that, you know, the stuff you're feeding your kids might have an impact on them and might be the reason why he has ADHD more you know, or more expressed form of it maybe and might be more struggling in school. Um, maybe he shouldn't be drinking coffee and sugar and all that and he's 11 and I don't know but yeah it's really interesting to see that connection. Thanks Jason, thanks for asking. Yeah. And, and I do think that it's a severely understudied branch of science, like all nutritional research, I, I think it definitely needs much more attention and funding. Um, there are a lot of uh, really important implications. From it. So kudos to you for just diving into it and sticking with it. It's, it's really cool to see. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. We look forward to your senior honors thesis and your master's thesis and your PhD dissertation. And as you continue to pursue these topics, yeah, be sure to send me copies. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. All right. I think we've made Kylie answer about 10 minutes of questions now. Um, feel free to stick around for a few minutes if you want to chat more, but that is officially the end of our Omni Fall 20, Spring 2020. Thank you, everyone, for attending and participating. Thank you, Jonathan. Great job as moderator and host, and you've just put in a lot of hours this week, and, and we all appreciate it. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for showing up all these days.